My friends, so yeah, I'm not home and Wagner's Rebellion lasted a good 24 hours. This is the 900 kilometer road trip of Wagner's March of Justice towards Moscow. And this is a good summary of what happened. Wow, this has just been such a pleasure. I, I'm such a lucky boy. I can't wait to go home. Now you're probably wondering the reasons behind all this. Was it a psyop? Was it a real coup? Well, according to the Prigo man himself, it was some sort of armed protest because PMC Wagner was supposed to be disbanded on July 1st, 2023 due to some political intrigue. However, one thing that left me wondering was the statement from Prigozhin, the night of the insurrection. Our commander was behind the whole operation. He's the best strategist in the world, Dmitry Utkin. More on that later. But why would Russia want to disband Wagner? They flew from one victory to another. Now, this is where I'll start some speculations. The Wagnerians had been fighting very well in Ukraine. They won the decisive Battle of Popasna, which opened up the Russian victories at Severodonetsk and Izichansk. But it became clear to Prigozhin that his PMC was limited by numbers. They would need more people. So in July 2022, they started recruiting in prisons. And by the end of the summer, only 300 inmates had signed up. Disappointment. It's really between September and November that Wagner stepped up its recruiting campaign. I think at first the Russian government let Wagner do their thing because they did not expect that many inmates to enlist. Think about it, Wagner went from approximately 8,000 fighters to a staggering 50,000 within a couple months. Wagner was not a little PMC anymore, it became an army. It's like if you wingman for one of your friends, help him with his game, and all of a sudden he gets all the girls from you. You're like, hold on, this is getting out of hands. And this is exactly what the Ministry of Defense thought of Wagner. And from this moment on, tensions kept increasing. We can assume that they feared that Prigozhin would blackmail them. Do this or that for me or I march on Moscow. And in some strange coincidence, have a look at this interview between Prigozhin and Wargonzo. Perhaps we can believe that from this moment on, the seed was planted in Prigozhin's mind and that he planned this exact thing as a last resort. In the end, all this turned into some personal beef between Prigozhin and Shoigu. As Wagner was winning the Battle of Bakhmut on its own, the Russian Ministry of Defense wanted to assert their dominance. To remind Prigozhin, who is the real boss, the first strike happened in February 2023, when the Russian government banned Wagner from recruiting in prisons. Perhaps they feared that Wagner would grow to an army of 100,000 men. A huge sausage fest and nobody likes that. But this wasn't enough because Wagner kept winning. And we can speculate that perhaps this is when the Ministry of Defense started holding off ammunition supplies at times. What's funny is that I was working on a video just before the mutiny and it sort of explained another aspect of this rebellion. For months now, the Russian High Command was restructuring its entire army and they did notice the effectiveness of the Wagnerians. However, I suppose the Russian HQ didn't want an elite battle corps to hoard all the talent and knowledge for themselves. They didn't want a waffen -SS within the Wehrmacht type of scenario. They wanted all the regiments to be of good quality by attaching experienced Wagnerian assault detachments to them. That's where the idea of breaking down Wagner must have appeared in late spring. That's how the Russian Ministry of Defense could strike two birds with one stone. On one end, you remove the threat of Wagner pulling a coup d'etat. And on the other, you increase the overall quality of Russian regiments. However, before we jump into the rabbit hole, 
Let's go back to the timeline of this rebellion. Uprising, mutiny, whatever you call it. It all started with a so-called Russian missile strike on Wagner's base, which allegedly caused the death of 30 Wagnerians. In this video, we only see some burnt bushes somewhere in the middle of a forest, which, to be honest, is not very convincing. Then the people of Rastav woke up with a bunch of Wagnerian Red Z tanks in the city center. Moments later, people recorded one of Wagner's columns going to the airfield east of Rastov and noted that they were equipped with Panzer air defense systems. Without firing a single shot, the musicians took control of the headquarters of the Southern Front in Rastov. And here we can see Prigozhin talking with Yevkurov, the deputy head of the main directorate of the general staff. And on the right side, General Vladimir Alexev, where Prigozhin essentially said, We'll go to Moscow until we get the chief of the general staff and Shoigu. Yet, this mutiny had its fair share of memes, like this girl taking graduation pictures with this Wagnerian T90S in the background. Someone said, Uprising? First, let me get some booze. Rebel tanks might be taking over, but the streets have to stay clean. Meanwhile, lightly armored columns of Wagnerians pushed north. They were spotted in the small town of Pavlovsk south of the major city of Varonezh. In this video, we can count over 20 technicals, trucks and buses filled with troops, as well as some armored vehicles. In the same sector, we could even see a tank on the trailer, once again with a technical behind. Some old memories of Wagner on the African front. So according to my estimate, this column would comprise of roughly 200 to 250 Wagnerian rebels. In multiple columns, they pushed another 100 kilometers north until they were stopped by the military police of Baronish and were forced to bypass the city and do a 250 kilometer detour through the Lipetsk region until they got north of Baronish back on the main highway. Here we can see a column of this march of justice in Yilets. Information about the total number of vehicles and personnel in the column varies. Prigozhin claimed that his 25,000 men were involved in this march on Moscow. However, people on the ground say 150 pieces of equipment. Others said 400 pieces in four separate columns. Or perhaps it was the same column spotted four times. In my opinion, it was closer to 150 vehicles, which according to my estimates would mean 1,500 Wagnerians involved in this operation, plus maybe a couple hundreds in Rastov. Meaning that over 20,000 musicians of the orchestra did not participate in this armed protest. Notice how they race at full speed along highways. Tanks and some infantry vehicles are transported on trailers. They don't garrison the cities they pass through. None of this would indicate the preparation of a coup. It seems Prigozhin simply wanted to be heard by Putin. However, as you can imagine, involving tanks and machine guns in your protest can escalate really fast. This is when Putin addressed the nation. This is when key figures made videos asking Prigozhin to stop and stated their support for the president, like this Cossack battalion commander. Or General Alexev, we even saw the intervention of General Surovikin. Overall, the population fully sided with President Putin. And many started tearing down Wagner's recruitment posters. In the countryside, tractors dug holes in the roads in order to halt PMC Wagner. Others used their trucks to form barrages. Here you can see how the PMC broke through one of such civilian checkpoints. It became clear that they were closing in on Moscow with little to no fighting on the ground. Most firefights seemed to have been from Russian aircraft targeting the Wagner columns. And to everyone's surprise, Wagnerians fired back at these helicopters. The PMC, being only 300 kilometers south from Moscow, Russian law enforcement started taking positions along the Oka River, since there are only five bridges going over it in the sector. For example, they removed the bridge going across at Kalomna, 
just in case they brought reinforcements and prepared quick entrenchments in case of a firefight. Meanwhile in the south, in Arastov, still no firefights. The mercenaries are just chilling. Here you can see some of them at a local restaurant, like this one called Meat Story. Yet the Russian government reacted and sent some Chechens from Ahmad detachments towards Rostov. Hundreds of Chechen vehicles spread over kilometers waiting to intervene. Take a look at these construction workers carrying their shifts as a column of Chechen armed vehicles was entering Rostov to dislodge PMC Wagner. From a tactical perspective, the goal was to encircle the rebels and take the city into a pincer. At this moment, the Wagner PMC would have had to storm the bridges across the Oka River to reach Moscow, and in the south, perhaps engage in firefights against the Chechens in Rostov. Without proper logistics, time was against Wagner. Meanwhile, the speech of the president and the destruction of Russian aircraft definitely scared Prigozhin and convinced him that his operation was going too far and that they would lose anyway without Putin's support. And all of a sudden, as girls were preparing to go to bed and the boys fixed on their phones for another sleepless night, on Saturday, June 24th, around 9 p.m., Wagner agreed to end the insurrection through a mediation with President Lukashenko from Belarus. And just like that, Prigozhin ordered his columns to go back to the camps so that the Russian blood does not spill. Easy to say when reportedly seven Russian aircraft were shot down by Wagner's air defense. According to the recent estimates, we're talking about roughly 13 KIA. Either Russia took Maskirovka to a whole new level, or it wasn't a PSYOP. Anyway, in these videos, you can see entire squads of Wagnerian troops marching down the streets and preparing to withdraw from Rostov, surrounded by curious locals. Some even took time to salute them and take pictures. Or perhaps Wagnerians were just trying to snatch some new recruits. Many political analysts claim that the end of this mutiny could not have been done without some backroom negotiations, some sort of deal. People expressed some rumors and possibilities. Number one, criminal proceedings against Prigozhin will be terminated and Wagner PMC fighters will be given immunity. So this one seems to have been confirmed. Gerasimov and Shoigu will resign. Dumin, the current governor of Tula, would replace Shoigu as minister of defense. Strangely, in the past day, we've seen more videos of Dumin pop up, where he's surrounded by members of the Russian armed forces. He's highly respected in Russia because he played a key role in the annexation of Crimea. Most importantly, he's the former head of the GRU, the special forces of the main directorate of the general staff. And surprise, surprise, like we've seen in this video I posted, most of Wagner's commanders are also former officers of the GRU. And this could explain why Prigozhin said, Our commander was behind the whole operation. He is the best strategist in the world. Talking about the original Wagner, Dmitry Utkin. And what do we know about him? Well, Utkin served as the commander of the 700 separate special detachment of the GRU. And guess who is also a former head of the GRU? That's right, General Alexeyev. Perhaps this entire rebellion was a power play between the GRU and the FSB. However, according to the latest news, Shoigu and Gerasimov are both still in position. From a political perspective, for Putin to dismiss his Minister of Defense after such an uprising would be a show of weakness, as it could open a Pandora's box. At the same time, the Russian government could also not be too harsh on the rebels, since PMC Wagner is still extremely popular in Russia for the decisive role they played during the Battle of Bakhmut. Now last point, Wagner PMC troops will be incorporated and merged into the Russian armed forces. Peskov already announced that a lot of Wagnerians ended up signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, even before the rebellion. It was also noted that Wagner fighters that took part in the mutiny would not be allowed into the Russian armed forces. Strange coincidence, considering that in the last week, it was reported that Wagner was actively looking for foreign translators of Arabic and French. We can assume that Wagner will be sent back abroad for its PMC duties. You see, for government, it's better to have your PMC deployed abroad and do their thing far away from the capital. 
Meanwhile, according to the latest news, the construction of a military camp for PMC Wagner began in Belarus, in some forest in the Mogilev region. The first camp is allegedly planned in Ozipovici, 200 kilometers from the border with Ukraine, designed to house eight thousand people. I think this could be a base for sabotage and infiltration missions by Wagnerians across the border, just to push their tip north of Kyiv, forcing Ukraine to redeploy some much needed troops there. At the same time, who knows how many Belarusians could enlist with Wagner in order to bolster their numbers. So in a way, Prigozhin's mutiny was partially successful, as the Wagner Corps was not entirely disbanded. Another thing that I thought was interesting that went relatively unnoticed is something that Poroshenko, the former president of Ukraine, said. He claims that Ukraine went through similar things between 2014 and 2016. Remember, during the first days of the war in Donbass, Ukraine had basically no standing army. Many volunteers formed their own units. And this is where Ukrainian oligarchs raised and funded their own regiments that were naturally growing more and more powerful. Poroshenko eventually ordered to clean up all these semi-independent units and forcefully subordinate them directly to the armed forces of Ukraine. Once again, done for political reasons. Like we saw, one of the root causes of the mutiny of the Wagner Corps could also be in the reorganization of the Russian army. In the recent weeks, we heard more and more about Russian Storm Z units. On June 19th, south of Marinka, Russian Telegram reported that crack troops including the new specially trained Storm Z units, have been introduced with great success. On June 20th, it was reported that the Russian Storm Z battalion had taken a forest near Makarivka. The same day, the Ukrainians captured one of these Storm Z fighters who claims to have never fought in his life. On June 20th again, the ISW wrote, the recent commitment of Storm Z units to the Kharkiv Luhansk Oblast front line likely explains the increased number of attacks reported near Kremina over the previous few days, as it appears that Russian forces have committed a relatively large quantity of low-quality forces to frontal infantry assaults. Very interesting how they never use such words to describe Ukrainian Territorial Defense Brigades, but yeah, that's another topic. And here again, Ukrainians reported that enemy Storm Z units have been attempting to storm the positions of the Ukrainian armed forces near Kupiansk. What are these Storm Z units anyway? essentially a copy-paste of Wagner's assault detachments. Because after banning Wagner from recruiting in prisons, the Russian Ministry of Defense did it themselves. On May 31st, it was said that the State Duma was going to legalize the recruitment of prisoners in the Russian army during the war. However, as opposed to Wagner's six-month contracts, the Moscow Times claims that recruited inmates would only be released from service at the end of the war. The worst deal I think I've ever seen negotiated. And not surprisingly, according to Wikipedia, only 2,000 have enlisted so far. However, this number might be underestimated because Russian newspaper Verstke claims that the Ministry of Defense actually recruited 15,000 prisoners. Here, they interviewed some of them attached to the 71st Regiment as they hold frontline positions. Ukrainians say those are low-quality troops. The Russians say they're crack units. Truth probably lies in the middle. In my opinion, inmates and new recruits are combined with more experienced troops in order to form Storm Z assault battalions. And this is where the Ministry of Defense probably had Wagner in mind. These experienced troops could be Wagnerians. We can suppose that by signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, Wagnerians would join these Storm Z units and essentially train Russian soldiers. From what I read, the main goal was to spread them out throughout the front, disseminating their new tactics to the rest of the Russian troops, incorporate them in every regiment into a joint effort. These assault detachments, either companies or battalions, would then be attached to every Russian regiment in order to beef up their offensive capabilities. But that's a topic for another video.